so as with the other speakers, I do have a lot of content. And um, I, I particularly wanted to link back um, what I'm discussing today with John Pratchik's uh, presentation first thing this morning. I thought it was an excellent conceptualization of the concepts of value. And I'm going to build off of that theme in my deck and talk about how historically reimbursement systems have been a huge confounder of the core value proposition of innovation for patients. In other words, the selection of innovations and technologies over time has not always been driven by the patient outcomes um, and quality that it delivers to patients, but rather by other things, including the amount of money that is associated in terms of payment for the service to a hospital or a physician. And that complexity has often obscured a, a lot of the true objectives of our healthcare system. So it's one of the things that I like to talk about Hopefully this is working and people can see. So what we hope, of course, is that, as John described, value is being measured in a line with enhanced patient quality, safety, and outcomes. Uh, the reality in these systems is that the true, well, the practical value in a market sense for each stakeholder is different. The, the payer thinks of value differently from the hospital, differently from the physician, and differently from the patient. They have an overlap. Ostensibly, all are concerned with patient outcomes but they also have other factors they need to worry about. Um, so I, I suppose I could say that the reason I get out of bed in the morning and do what I do is a frustration over the bureaucracies of payment that get in the way of uh, good patients and good physicians accessing good technologies. And um, this confounding effect has interfered in the innovation and adoption of the latest technologies for many, many decades. So an example I reference on this page, um, we're doing a lot of work in neurostimulators right now where there are far less invasive versions of those uh, products that follow the Gen 1 products that were launched years ago. And because they're faster and easier to use, they pay physicians significantly less than the older technologies. And guess what? A lot of physicians are hesitant to use them because it will impact their revenues significantly. Um, now, there are evidence questions uh, on both sides, both for the traditional products and the newer ones, but it's one example how, in a way, payment systems are like driving a car, looking only through your rear view mirror. It's based on historical data and evidence, not necessarily describing the paradigm of care in the present. So when we talk about digital technologies, which is really kind of a big focus when we talk about the age of COVID, my presentation today, um, it's probably useful to bucket what we're speaking of. And I've come up with four buckets. This is by no means exhaustive. You could probably add a number of other dimensions to this, but starting with home use monitoring and diagnostic technologies, um, that's an area where we've seen quite a, a, a number of innovations. And I would say probably where the biggest gap still exists. Um, diabetes is an area, for example, where there had long been an interest to remotely monitor patient glucose, the numbers in HbA1c. Um, there are now handheld devices that can help track um, glucose monitors through the interstitial fluid and help pa patients really better um, self-monitor and self-manage their disease. So you transition from that left bucket into the wearable technologies category, and it opens up a whole sea of possibilities, often relying on smartphones. Then office-based uh, diagnostic technologies um, have been around for a while, both things that enhance the decision-making of a physician one-on-one, -on -one, or bring in the expertise of other physicians who are not there, um, and also help to really customize the therapy to a specific patient based on uh, sophisticated algorithms that better identify the markers for uh, disease and susceptibility to treatment. And then the last bucket, which is also very broad, I would say are surgical systems plus remote specialty care some of this has been around for a long time. So remote viewing of uh, imaging and x-rays in radiology, but more recently the use of surgical systems, both for a physician in real time in a single place, and even for a physician to use remotely, who's not in the operating room to, to conduct an operation using a robot. Um, as I said, there are many, many examples that don't cleanly fit into these buckets. In my mind, the biggest gap we have today is probably on the left side of this graph, durable medical equipment, which is often um, established first in the US Medicare program, does not face a payment pathway designed to recognize true innovation. And, and in fact, it's designed to apply precedent payment 
to the newer innovations in just about any way it can. So I see a building need for um, a, a, a revamping of our approach to paying for technology alongside these, these many innovations that uh, promise to actually dramatically enhance patient outcomes. So I won't spend much time on this, but one of the examples of a great innovation goes back to the Google cat experiment. Um, people probably have heard this, but they had this vast uh, network of computer processors and um, they basically taught the computer how to use a deep learning algorithm um, without really instructing it on how to find cats. And by browsing uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos, um, they looked at 10 million randomly uh, selected uh, videos and the computer was able to identify with accuracy uh, images of cats almost 75% of the time. So Google uh, now verily has gone on to apply this in a number of areas. One of them um, with a partner is diabetic retinopathy where the computer algorithm actually exceeds the human um, sensitivity for diagnosing that disease by something like 20%. So there's a big future out there and the technology is actually bring, bring great promise to patients, better quality. One of the things standing in the way of adoption of these things is just the way in which we pay for healthcare services. So that's where I'm gonna cover some of the basics, realizing that not everyone in the audience um, encounters reimbursement every day. And I think Ben, we had a, a poll question we wanted to share. Is that something that you're able to put up on screen? Yep, Sam, can you pull up uh, Stefan's poll question, please? Sure. This is just so I can understand the perspective of, of where people are coming from in the device world. If you wouldn't mind just checking the box in terms of your interests product-wise. I realize some folks, uh, like Hologic, for example, covers many of these areas. But it's helpful to me as I go through my slide deck. So implantable medical devices, surgical tool, home use DME, imaging, in vitro diagnostics, or other. Yes, yeah, Stefan, so I see, do see results coming in. Um, we'll give them another, I guess, 10 to 15 mm -hmm. seconds. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to belabor this. Um, All right, another five seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Three two, one. Okay, here are the results for you. Okay, very good. Right, so it's a nice distribution, actually a smaller chunk of home use DME devices than I expected to see, um, but a lot of hospital-based therapies on the implantable and surgical tool side. Um, imaging and in vitro diagnostics. So, for sure, the technologies I'm describing in having remote take capability are related to all of these or affect the, the care pathways for all of these. What is complex in our field of reimbursement is that coverage, coding, and payment are separate concepts. It's not entirely logical. You have more unified processes in Europe where there's a single health ministry, but essentially coverage are the rules of the road uh, and identification of the patients for which they cover a certain service. Coding is the nomenclature that describes it. And then payment is the amount that the provider receives for rendering the service. Um, oftentimes companies focus only on the coding aspect and they think or envision that their task is merely to get a code and then everything will work out. It's really not accurate. It's just one of the steps. And in fact, the hardest circumstance we see is when you're trapped by an existing code that pays too little. So just to bear in mind um, that it's a multi-pronged test to achieve a result. You also, in product launch, want to combine that knowledge with uh, a, a strong understanding of the unmet clinical need um, and the value proposition that your product will bring, um, the evidence that will be required, and of course, all of that in light of the local payer policies and the requirements they have, the coverage coding and payment that applies in your area. So moving on from there, just the, the thought process that we have applied to devices when they're launching is to construct a payer mix, mix for each device. Um, and that may be Medicare intensive, or if it's a pediatric product, it may not be. When it is uh, involving Medicare, that tends to be the benchmark that other payers will, will look at. So it's important to have a key focus on Medicare. They're a positive payer and may actually tend to pay for things sooner than commercial payers, um, if you're lucky. 
Um, the payment rates are not always uh, enormous, but it's a good place to get started. And of course, with the growing Medicare population, it can usually mean a substantial market. The trouble with Medicare though, is that it is driven by statutes and the statutes are not terribly progressive and don't always anticipate the care scenarios that might evolve with technology. So part A is hospital related insurance for inpatient and skilled nursing facilities and a few other settings. Um, it is divided from the care that you receive in a physician office, which is covered under Medicare Part, Medicare part B. Um, also that's rele relevant to device companies is the routine costs of clinical trials in terms of coverage and then coverage of the device itself for so-called category B devices. These are all sort of among the top 20 issues that we address. Um, if you're in the drug dispensing business, you might have other concerns outside of these benefit categories or DME. Um, the point of this slide though, is that there are different silos within Medicare that behave differently. And you have to understand the rules of the road by setting of care for your product. So linking up with COVID, um, it's important to mention uh, and talk a little bit about what was already underway before COVID arrived. And in fact, Medicare has been moving towards value-based initiatives now for some time. This was mentioned this morning as well. And some of the iterations of that are accountable care organizations, the hospital value-based purchasing initiative, and the advanced bundled payment initiative um, if you will, these are all experiments to try to break away from the silos that I just described into a more comprehensive approach of caring for patients, measuring quality and controlling costs. We know with silos, there's a lot of redundancy and waste from one provider to the next for the same patient. A repeating of imaging scans, of lab tests, and other steps that are done perhaps for defensive medicines, for legal reasons, or other issues that have nothing to do with quality of care. So this is a snapshot from a survey of ACOs. And I, I thought it was interesting because the priorities that the ACOs have mentioned, which is one of these areas of initiative, um, very much uh, coincide with the types of objectives we have now in the age of COVID. They wanna reduce avoidable ER visits, prevent readmissions, um, actively manage uh, high need, high cost patients, and so forth. So the point of my story here is that the trends we're now seeing with COVID are simply a dramatic acceleration of many of the things that were already in play. And actually in, in an ironic sense, perhaps a catalyst for the change that we've needed for many, many years. So here's a snapshot, which is probably now a little out of date of um, the Medicare COVID cases and some of the mortality rates. One of the findings that Medicare had was a huge disproportionate impact on renal disease patients um, a mortality rate amongst those patients that's almost four times greater than the broader uh, Medicare population. One of the things I'll mention <clears throat> in renal disease is first, it's, it's covering all um, patients uh, regardless of age, not just patients age 65 and older. This is by statute that goes back 50 years. Um, and also it has evolved to a fairly constrained bundled payment system that is not entirely technology friendly. So um, one of the issues that these patients have is a constant need uh, to go in for in-person dialysis at a dialysis center, which obviously in the early days of COVID increased their exposure to, COVID, to the disease. Um, there's now an interest to try to support better use of home dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, which is actually something we see that is very widespread in Europe. Um, so it's sort of forcing the clinical community and Medicare to update its thinking and progress towards new solutions. And along with that home use care, you're also gonna need technologies to better monitor the patients and keep track of the status of their disease. Um, so how have hospitals and health systems responded to the impact of COVID-19? Um, there's been a huge loss of private insurance in the population. Uh, so it's a shift from on the hospital side to rely more heavily on public payers. Uh, and in fact, the payment rates from those payers is much lower than commercial payers. So there's a loss of revenue there. Um, some of the more lucrative uh, departments um, may have struggled, but the less lucrative ones in the hospitals may have had to have been closed because they're not profitable. Uh, there are rural uh, hospitals which are really struggling um, and may have to, to shut off some of their services. Patients are a lot less likely to travel for their care. There is a relief fund uh, for hospitals, which the administration is supporting. Um, 
And the notion of substituting a lot of routine and elective in-person services with telehealth uh, got immediate traction by the administration. Um, one of the um, issues though is that the, the relief is coming a little bit too late and is not likely to compensate for the hit that the provider sector has taken. Um, and as you can see here from these headlines, there have been massive layoffs amongst many of the hospitals in affected areas. Um, I think I saw a question pop up. I'm happy to pause and answer that if it's fresh. Ben, are you able to see the question? Uh, it hasn't popped up, just the slide is there. Yep. So it just- ah, Here we go. Okay, yep, got it. I can read it. It says, in my experience, the bundling of product introduces a bias in favor of companies with a number of products. This becomes a barrier to entry for small companies with one product. In my case, it is advice. Can you comment? Yes, I completely agree. We know that in the US environment, just contracting is a huge barrier uh, to entry with a hospital. If you are a solo device producer and you're approaching uh, the Cleveland Clinic, their contracts department wants to limit the number of diverse suppliers they engage with. And they're more likely to want to purchase um, their products from a consolidated uh, distributor or a consolidated manufacturer that can offer 30 or 40 product lines. So there is a barrier <clears throat> at it from a transactional uh, space for, um, for small innovator companies, and it forces them to have to partner with larger device companies uh, or distributors in order to get their products in. I don't necessarily attribute that to the bundled payment system though. I think it's more of a business issue. Um, I, I perha perhaps your argument is that if they had separate payment for the device itself, they would have a, a greater fighting chance. That's a fair point. Um, you may still see though a lot of this in the environment just because of scale issues, commercial scale issues. Um, but it's, it's a great point. Um, so one of the big impacts of course has been um, delay or cancellation of elective procedures. Um, we know that 2018, um, medium uh, hospitals collected over half of their revenues from outpatient services. Those have been impacted dramatically. Um, and there is a, a, a concern that um, there's no one at the moment there to pick up the tab. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a health system that was not super efficient, frankly, from an overall cost perspective over the years, but has suddenly hit a brick wall. And it's a hugely disruptive moment um, on the positive side, it's an entry point and an opportunity for innovator companies that bring solutions in, in the way of technologies. So there is a, a positive side to this. So where are we in terms of reimbursement for these services? Um, if you look at the jargon from CMS, they distinguish between telehealth and telemedicine uh, services, where telehealth historically required some form of face-to-face -face interaction and telemedicine did not. Um, and basically, there are three buckets of activity that have happened historically. Earlier on, they had basic telehealth coding for follow-on emergency and management encounters when the patient was already established. And they had discounted payment rates for those services as compared to an in-office service. Then later, they came up with a new set of codes for chronic care remote physiologic monitoring. And by the way, these codes were issued probably about 20 years after the technology capabilities existed. Um, let's be honest, a payer is not thrilled with very easy, transactionally easy things to do um, in a remote capacity by physicians because of the fear that it will be volume inducing. It will double or triple the number of visits that a, a, a physician can sustain in a working day. And to a payer, that means added expense. So historically, they were very cautious about obliging a lot of services to be done in person, um, partly to sustain quality, but also partly because it helped to slow down the train in terms of inflationary practices. Well, fast forward to 2020, when the healthcare system um, has hit the brakes and they had to intervene, they issued broad and, and permanent uh, temporary additions to the telehealth list. Um, and an important change to note there is these are normal in-person services that are now paid at normal facility rates, not in a discounted fashion. So whereas before there were some services that could be paid at a discount with a modifier, that is no longer the case. And it's a huge leap forward in terms of 
these types of things, these types of remote reimbursements. The, the mechanics of this came through CMS issuing two interim final rules. Um, one was in late March and the other one was in May. This is not a normal rulemaking cycle. They issued just one notice with an interim final rule for, uh, with comments uh, possible, but it was effective very rapidly. And essentially in those documents, they identified two very broad buckets for telehealth services those that are similar to professional consultations, office visits, and psychiatric services that were already on the list of telehealth. Um, so if you were similar to something already listed, um, you might be able to borrow an existing code or be assigned a fresh one. And then the category two uh, products were those that were not similar to those already being listed. And then there were a lot of questions about whether existing codes could be used. Um, and also an evaluation of evidence to establish clinical benefit for patients. So it's a new way of thinking, frankly, for CMS and a departure from what they had done historically. Here's a snapshot of just the first rule. Um, they did it in increments. Basically, the first step was to give flexibility uh, for services that you'd use remote communications. Um, and then an expansion on a temporary emergency basis of other services. They eliminated the frequency requirements. So in the past, these monitoring or telehealth services were capped at the number of times you could bill them per patient over a certain period of time. They've taken that away. Um, and importantly, they made the payment rates equivalent to the in-person rates. Um, that's important because it provides room for value-added innovations to be compensated by the provider. The provider now can afford to use these uh, extra services that enhance their capabilities. Um, and then flexibility on required hands-on visits for end-stage renal disease for, for reasons I, I described a minute ago. So there were a number of CPT codes added to the list of eligible services. Notice here, some of these are not what you would expect, inpatient neonatal and pediatric critical care. What they've facilitated there is the remote uh, intervention of experts who are not physically on site in helping to guide the care of neonates and pediatric uh, patients in the hospital. Um, so they've taken a much more flexible approach. And really, I think this is opening the door to the technology potential we've had for decades for the very first time. Uh, in the second rule, they further expanded what they started in the first, uh, the further enabling remote care. Um, they expanded the definition of a provider-based department to include the patient home. So now the clinicians can get paid their facility fee as if they were treating a patient in the office um, when they are overseeing a patient being treated in the home remotely. Um, they also allowed for audio only evaluation and management rather than uh, insisting on video. Uh, I can tell you I have patients in their 80s, or I have patients, I have parents in their 80s, and it is not possible for them to figure out Zoom. So Having that aspect is, is a big step forward. Um, and you can see here some of the details of what they did with specific codes, which I won't get into. So here is some of the, de the closer uh, detail in terms of the permanent additions to the telehealth list on the left. Um, and those on the right are temporary. I think there will be a number of folks uh, advocating to make the ones on the right also permanent. And there's many technologies that can fit into these settings and these care pathways, which will add value. You see here at the bottom a quote by Seema Verna, who said that the advent of telehealth has just been completely accelerated and that there's really no going back. And I, I actually think that's quite exciting. It, it, ironically, this terrible tragedy of COVID might actually be the catalyst for change that the US market has needed for years. Um, just one other afterthought, if you're seeking to launch a new technology and there is not existing a code already to describe it in the telehealth space, CMS has described the evidence it's looking for to add new technologies to the list of covered services. Um, and it may be it's, it's been a service around for years, it's just not on the telehealth list. You would have to demonstrate these things in the context of use as a telehealth service, not that it just works in a face-to-face -face clinic. And then the question I'm sure becomes, well, what kind of studies does one need to prove that? That's where it gets interesting in dialogue with CMS. And none of this is probably terribly surprising. So some stats on the impact of COVID and what's been going on. Um, the private insurance claims for telehealth increased dramatically 
And at the, the time of uh, these data were collected back in March, the Northeast had skyrocketed. I suspect now you would see that this graph would be very different on the right side in the South and Midwest and West. Despite cost sharing waivers for COVID-19 treatment, um, the low utilization has actually meant a good deal of profitability for most insurers. So they've made money <laughs> in this window of time. Although they had to waive premiums for a number of their beneficiaries. And then in the Medicare population, you saw similar explosive growth. So over a 13,000% increase of claims uh, involving telehealth services. A lot of it was evaluation and management. So um, I don't know if I'm early or late. I'm hoping uh, there will be questions, but I'll just wrap up with some of the just thinking about new issues to be addressed moving forward. Um, a number of other things have come along in recent days about how prescriptions covered under Part D um, are being widely used instead of physician-administered drugs under Part B. So if those of you who are in that world uh, are familiar that Part B drugs, first of all, garnered a, a fee for the physicians historically 6%. Um, and there were rules against those drugs being available if they were also available in self-administered forms. They're moving on from that and obviously seeing the benefits of patient self-administration. The reality is a lot of drug companies formulated their drugs to make them uh, physician administered, even when it wasn't essential to capture uh, the more robust payment pathway under Part B. That could be melting away because of this change. Um, there will need to be new, new workflows as telehealth momentum continues. Um, it's a different way of thinking, and it's no longer about the transaction of a patient physically coming to an office or a hospital, um, which I think is a good thing. About a third of COVID deaths happen in long-term care facilities. So there is going to need to be a cultural shift in how long-term care is provided, and a thought that home-based care may need to be a better solution as you may know, there is no Medicare benefit beyond an initial 90 days after hospitalization for long-term care. And then as states reopen and hospitals resume elective procedures, uh, there will certainly be pressure on the lucrative departments within the hospitals to provide procedures to make up for lost revenue and a lot of trimming, frankly, of the unprofitable uh, offerings. So it's gonna be a, a belt tightening, uh, the likes of which we have not seen in healthcare in a very long time. So if you're a device company, what should you be thinking about? Um, I think that a lot of the shift is here to stay. Um, private payers will tend to follow in the footsteps of Medicare eventually. Um, and in some cases, more progressively, if you have like a workforce issue that is benefited uh, by your product, so workers' comp and such. Um, reimbursement rates for remote services are currently the same for in-person services. That's a huge step forward. And it means that the profitability and sustainability for physicians and other providers is now a reality for the first time with telehealth. And it probably was not so before. Simple low-tech telemedicine services are likely to reach a wider range of patients, um, some of whom are not tech savvy. So that means there are new solutions that are needed to make it simpler and easier to use. Um, and I do wanna mention those of you who are in the durable medical equipment space, that's where I see frankly the biggest gap uh, the biggest conflict between payment policy and the need on the patient side to be managed in their home. Durable medical equipment framework for payment in Medicare is not technology friendly. Its purpose is to assign your new innovation, uh, the most readily available existing payment from a predecessor product. So that's where there's a huge struggle. And I think industry is starting to organize to push back on that. It's a framework that was issued last fall and it was not a positive step forward. Um, hopefully in the context of uh, COVID, there will be an ability to change that and create some special pathways for innovation. So that is everything I have. This is just a table of codes of the, of the remote monitoring uh, codes that were issued in 2019. We've got a minute perhaps for a question or two. Ben, um, is there anything I can answer on your side or? Uh, let's see, in the chat box, there was one that just said, these are excellent materials. Will these slides be available after the presentation? And Sam said uh, to email the team to get a copy of those. And I don't see any other questions. Anyone yep. in the audience have any further questions for Stefan? Yep. 
And right. the answer is yes, this is different from the version of the deck I shared with Sam early, earlier. So I will make this available. We're happy to provide it. We're also hap happy to provide a free consult to companies on the phone today. And I think Sam uh, has the details to make that possible. If anyone's interested in that, please reach out to him. Um, so obviously the devil's in the details. If you have a medical device or diagnostic, your circumstance uh, will depend a lot on these various factors I mentioned today. And it's, it's probably uh, useful to have a more detailed discussion. Thank you again, Stefan. And yep, just to reiterate, um, is we will be sharing his updated slide deck for those interested. If you want to have a quick call or, or email introduction with Stefan and his team, uh, do let us know. Thank you so much, Stefan. Yep, my pleasure. Thank you.